All right, everybody. Uh, this is the legendary Greg Voros. Get your cameras ready. All right, Greg's going to talk to us. Can't think of a better person to talk about guitar care, guitar maintenance. Uh, you're going to, he's had, he's worked on Chet Atkins instruments. He's worked on all kinds of famous people's instruments, more than I would care to remember he has worked on. Uh, instruments that he's worked on have been hanging in the Country Music Hall of Fame. So, so um, one of the one of the best guitar techs in the world. Um, talk to you a little bit about guitar care. If you have questions, just shout them on out. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Greg Boros. Thank you. You guys are great. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say, you know, I, I remember doing the very first uh, gathering. You know, and some of you folks were here, and that was some um, six years ago, was it now? Um, was it about six years ago? Eight, eight, eight years ago. Wow. <laughs> and um, I, I'll, I'll never forget. I was I was working at Grooms, and I was at Grooms for about three years. And the phone the phone call came in, and uh, it was Eddie Prince. And Steve asked me if I was uh, interested in going down and doing a, a guitar setup uh, maintenance related workshop for a group of students uh, for this uh, gathering that he's putting together. And I said, yeah, absolutely, that sounds good. And I remember it was at the, uh, the Global Cafe, which is right across the street. And now it's more than readable, but it was the Global Cafe right across the street from Green. And it was really easy for me. I just went ahead and punched out <laughs> at work, and I, then, I, then I shot across the street, and I did a, a workshop, and it took about an hour and a half or so. And there was maybe 10 or maybe 12, 15 folks or so that came down, and uh, everyone had a really good time, you know, and I, I got a chance to meet some really um, cool people. Over the years, uh, it has grown quite a bit, you know, and now that I'm seeing you folks, most of you guys I already know, and, and I've known for a number of years, um, it, it, it's, it's such a beautiful thing, you know, and, and everyone is super excited about um, the instructors, Steve, um, and everybody's just it's just so awesome. I, I really want to say thank you for me going out to you guys. I really appreciate this, and uh, this has been incredible for me. Um, but uh, I, I really just want to say that this is something very special. Uh, this gathering as a whole, and all of you guys that are that are here and taking part in it. Um, I think you guys are realizing that. I really uh, think it's an awesome thing. I also want to thank Steve Krenz, uh, wherever you are, Steve. Yes. Um, there you are. For, uh, for being a great friend and, and just being an awesome all around person. Um, Steve Krenz is the real deal. Uh, uh, to be able to do uh, these type of events and, and just have a good time with one of the best guitar players in Nashville is really humbling for me as well. It's, it's unbelievable. Steve is a, is a great guy, tremendous respect for him, and uh, he, he's a great guy. So thank you again. You're, 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 you're wonderful. Um, when I, when I uh, released my, my set of DVD some years ago, what I really wanted to do was to demystify the, the guitar in terms of how it's constructed and how it functions as a whole, you know? And um, there's a lot of folks that really um, want to put a lot of mystery into how all of this works. And uh, it, it's really pretty straightforward. It's a lot more straightforward than, than a lot of people think. It's one of those things that once you get it, you can't unget it, you know? And it took me a, a few years of doing it for a living before I actually sat back in, uh, you know, in, in my chair, in my stool, at my bench, and I was doing a setup one day, and then the, the light just shined, and the big light bulb came over my head, where I finally understand this. And then I was frustrated in terms of in terms of setup and, and, and how a setup really works. And then I, then I said, okay, now I get it. That's wonderful. I could. I could move forward, it's no longer mysterious, I, it's a beautiful thing. But then I was frustrated with myself that I couldn't figure it out sooner, you know? And it really, uh, it really played with me, it really messed with my head on, on uh, how I was taught um, to repair instruments. And there's a lot of mystery behind it, and it really doesn't need to be that mysterious at all. It's pretty straightforward. But even when you, get to, uh, when you get to a restoration project, which is still a maintenance related repair. It just takes 50 to 100 years or so before you need that, uh, 
that type of maintenance related repair, but it's still maintenance related. And there's a, a process to do it. It's not about, uh, you know, I'm going to think about it, I'm going to cross my fingers, I'm going to shoot for this, let's hope this works. There's, there's, there's science behind it, and, and the science makes sense. It, it's, it's all there. And, and if you break that down into a series of steps, um, everything becomes way more clear. As far as the setup goes, the, we call it the basic setup. is isn't really basic at all because uh, most repair guys can't get on the same page with it. You know, um, there's still this headspace of me working on an instrument and uh, it's almost as a, as a recipe. I have the recipe <laughs> and, uh, and I know how to make that recipe just right. That's why everyone comes to, to me or whomever is saying that. And I think that's cool and I think that's wonderful. I look at it in a little bit of a different way, where I think setups are pretty straightforward, you know, and uh, there's really three basic steps to most setups, uh, especially a flat top. The flat top is one of the easiest setups out there, period. And um, uh, it, it, it's really simple in that way. I think a lot of times uh, people still uh, don't really truly understand how the instrument works. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and do a setup on this instrument. And I'll go through step by step and exactly what I'm doing. I'll give you guys some pointers along the way, you know, and um, in hopes that you guys will attempt to uh, do this type of repair work yourselves. Um, as far as the setups, you know, it, it, truth be told, I mean, if you do a, a handful of setups um, over the course of a, a few months, it'll start getting easier. It'll start getting easier. Um, maybe it's easy for me because uh, I'm working on other people's instruments. <laughs> <You know? laughs> maybe. Um, so I can understand, especially having a, a nice, beautiful uh, new instrument, how you'd be hesitant into even changing the strings. I'm going to go ahead and take this to somebody to get it done professionally or whatever it might be. I think what's important to, to know is that when you take it to most places in the country, um, the person doing the work might not know very much more than you do yourself. And that's just the reality in, in music stores, which is really important. I remember when I first started doing this for a living, my first day on the job, I was already servicing folks' instruments, which is, is kind of gross if you think about it um, as a whole. But to understand, and I spoke about, uh, about this to some of you guys, there's no standard for, for, for this trade as a whole. There's, there's no standard whatsoever. Um, in, in any other trade, there was an established standard for plumbers, electricians, you name it. There are proper ways to do things. This is always kind of, <clears throat> was kind of cloaked in mystery, almost uh, like watch repairs, where if you were uh, working on, on high-end uh, timepieces, you usually acquired that knowledge from, from a, uh, a person teaching it, an elder a teacher, a mentor in that way, and you'd be the apprentice, and you would learn in that way. It's old school, and I respect that, and I think it's wonderful. I really do. I think it's wonderful. The problem <clears throat> with that is that most folks that take that role as a mentor are not qualified to be there. And as a result, you have a lot of repair guys that are being taught in a certain way. Um, I see that every single day, um, and it's really kind of disappointing. You know, kind of disappointing. So one of the things that I try to do is I speak publicly about how to <coughs> establish a, a standard, true to form standard for repair guys to all uh, agree on so that we can stop ruining guitars as a whole and start really uh, providing a, a fantastic service for, for paying customers. What a concept. If you're going to pay for something to be done in a professional manner, what a concept. We should know what we're doing, you know. And, and we should be able to understand it and speak well about it because it's something that we do understand. So that's one of the things that I try to really um, work on and, and, I, and I focus on, and it's, uh, it's a lot harder than you would think. <laughs> a lot of times I tell folks it's like trying to herd cats with some fairy guys, you know. <laughs> Trust me, this is a good idea, you know. Come, come on, you know, <laughs> or whatever it might be. But I always, but I, always um, I always really focus on basic setup because when I break down a basic setup and how it works, it's done in three, three steps. And all repairs can be done in this way just by breaking it down into a few different um, uh, steps. In, in the proper order, if you execute it uh, the same way every time, you'll get a perfect setup. Every single time. A lot of folks think that, oh, I play a mandolin, I play a banjo, um, so my setup should be a little bit different. Um, maybe a hair, uh, as far as banjo goes, but a mandolin, a flat top, an arch top guitar, 
an electric guitar, whichever electric guitar it is, whether it be a Les Paul, whether it be a Strat, Tele, doesn't matter, a Jackson, whatever it might be, um, the difference in setup on all of those instruments is a 32nd of an inch at the saddle. That's the difference. In all of those setups, that's the difference. So people can cloak it all they want into this mysterious way that you know, I'm the best mandolin setup guy in town or so on and so forth. It is what it is. Barbara took one of my uh, um, uh, weekend classes and, and she was a great example for it. And every time I've done these classes, what I find awesome about it is all walks of life, folks, come down. You know, some guys are, some gals are retired, some are, you know, doctors, some guys are golfers, it doesn't matter. All walks of life, all age groups come down. And what's amazing about it is after the weekend is over, all of those eight or ten folks are able to do a proper fret dress on an instrument and are able to set up their instruments in a beautiful way where I couldn't do it any better. That's what it comes down to. I like the fact that I didn't see Barbara's name on my setup list. <laughs> that's a beautiful. That's a beautiful thing because you get it, you understand it, you know. And it's it's one thing to uh, to, to have me do it. I love hanging. And I love explaining things. And there's something to be said for, here's my guitar. I'll come pick it up, and it'll be awesome. That, that's wonderful. But if you guys do want to get into this, especially setup work, um, it's really pretty straightforward. I'm going to show you guys how to do it. So. Um, well, I, I wanted to start with a flat top. The flat top guitar is, 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 is the easiest yeah. and the most straightforward setup. There's really only three places I can make an adjustment. And as long as I make these adjustments in the right order, it'll come out perfect every time. So this is a great example of it too, because a uh, young couple that I'm working on it for, um, they have a matching Fender acoustic instrument that's almost the same model. I think it might be a hair off, but it's, it, it's almost the same in, in being what model it is. Um, What's cool about this is I can give this one a setup, and then two hours later I can give the other one a setup, and the specs will be exactly the same. And if I give that instrument a setup a year later, it'll be exactly the same again. You know, um, that's what it comes down to. Here's another thing. As far as um, before I get into this, uh, another thing. Uh, you know, music, uh, musicians are, are very um, fascinating. They're they're awesome folks, and they're very fascinating in a lot of ways. And a lot of People think that their setup specs are so much different than anybody else's. You know, uh, I, oh, I like it. I know I'm a little weird because I like my mind like this or so on and so forth. And it, in some way, everyone falls into uh, <laughs> that same boat in some way. And um, but truth be told, 99% of players are exactly the same. The reason is that you get used to the way your instrument plays is because it moves around. And if you get the instrument set up by different guys. Uh, across different states or whatever it might be, it might be a hair off. And sometimes a hair off or a hair different um, could be uh, could be fine too, but it, but what's important is that it can be better. It can be better. Um, but most guys are the same. I think there's one person that I always single out as saying that, okay, this person is truly different, and that's Ranger Doug Green from the Time Jumpers. Uh, Ranger Doug is amazing. He's unbelievable. I remember uh, I did a setup for him, and I was excited to work on his guitar some seven years ago. And uh, I gave it back to him. It's a big, beautiful Stromberg arch top. And I gave it back to him, and it was played great. All the guys in the shop played it. They were like, oh, he's going to love this, you know, and I gave it back to him. And he goes, hey, Greg, this is good, but can you bring the action up? You usually don't hear that. All right, yeah, I'll bring the action up. So I bring the action up, I intonate it, I brought it up by 30 seconds. He played it. He goes, no, no, it needs to come up more. Okay, cool. No, Greg, just a little bit more, please, for me, just a little bit more. Next thing you know, his setup is so unusual and unique in a way that he falls into that 1%. Uh, he's got such a heavy right hand that his action has to be unbelievably high in order for him to have that guitar project in volume uh, that way, and I get it. Uh, I couldn't even form two chords on that guitar, personally. He's got some, he's got some, some hands, you know. He's awesome, you know. Um, but 99% of players are really um, are, are very much the same. So I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you guys the recipe for 99%. So the first thing I always do is I'll tune the guitar to pitch. And this instrument is uh, tuned to pitch, pitch, so I'm ready to go. Um, it's really important that you take some measurements and you make some adjustments with the old strings. A lot of folks get a new set of strings, and the first thing they do is they take off the old set of strings and they clean it up and they start stringing it up. Um, I think uh, it would be a good idea 
to know what the instrument is doing under full string tension. When you're adjusting your truss rod, it is always under full string tension. When you're making adjustments, everything is under full string tension. If I make a truss rod adjustment, I'll come back and I'll tune it again. Okay? If I if I adjust the nut slot, I'll put the string back, I'll tune it up to pitch again. I'll take my measurements. But everything has to be done under full string tension. So my table is a little low here, so I'm gonna kinda look a little awkward, so I'll go ahead and do it. So the first thing I always do is I make sure it's it's tuned to tuned to pitch. And then the second thing is I'm gonna take my my, my pinky and put it on the 14th fret on the high E string from my index finger and put it on the first fret. I'll go ahead and tap in the center. Okay, right around the seventh fret or so. Alright? I'll do that on the high E string. I'll do the same thing on the low E string. Okay? This tells me exactly how much relief that the neck has where the truss rod is actually able to make an adjustment. The truss rod is a reinforcement, adjustable reinforcement bar that lays inside of your neck underneath the finger. Um, you're able to make periodic adjustments to it depending on how the neck moves around under string tension or different behavior conditions. So the general rule in where your neck or how much neck relief you should have, okay, we're talking thousandths of an inch. What does that mean? Almost perfectly straight, what that means. So I could say, oh, okay, you take a feeler gauge of four thousandths and you, you, know, you slide it under the seventh fret, two pieces of paper folded over, slide it under the seventh fret. The reality is if you're tapping on the low E string and the high E string, if there's a hair of a gap, if there's a gap period and the string isn't resting on, on all the frets, you're there. That's where you need to be, okay? Um, some people think, oh, I play harder, much, much harder with my right hand, so I need a lot of relief in my neck. Absolutely not. That's a big myth. Um, you want your neck almost perfectly straight. What happens when you put too much relief in your neck, and you guys will see it as I pick up your instruments and I play it, I almost do the same thing every single time, is I'll come right up around the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th frets, and I'll play the high E string, and I'll walk it up. And that tells me uh, a number of things. That tells me what kind of fret work you have, um, it tells me how much relief you have in your neck. I'll get into that in a second. So, when the truss rod actually makes an adjustment, it makes an adjustment from the first to about the tenth, maybe eleventh, twelfth frets. The anchor point should be around the fourteenth. But when you actually tighten up that truss rod, it pushes against itself towards the center of the board. So when you're tightening it up, what really happens in a dual action truss, even a single action truss rod is that the center point actually comes up just a little bit. That's how you get back load. If you want relief, you want to loosen it up and then you'll slack that and it'll go the opposite, okay? But since it's only taking place, that adjustment itself is only taking place from the first till about the 12th fret, okay? Well, what happens to the rest of it? What happens to the rest of it? That, that's, that's really important to think about, which is why you need to have a neck that's almost completely straight, because if you don't, what will wind up happening if you have too much relief is that we'll have a high spot right around this area right here. And the high spot will give itself away when you're playing your high E string, okay? So in that, you can have the same action. I can have 20 thousandths of relief in my neck. I can compensate for action. I'll get into the actual specs on that from the saddle. So when I measure my action off the 12th fret with a ruler, right now I have just a hair over 2.30 seconds and just a hair over 3.30 seconds with the first fret held down when I bypass the nut. So when I take that, uh, that, that measurement off the 12th fret, I can make a series of adjustments um, by straightening out the neck, which will drop the action, bringing up the saddle to compensate for that, measure the action, I'll come back at the same exact number, but the entire instrument would have moved in that way. And, and, and the difference would be that these notes are all of a sudden playable with the same exact action. That's why you can't really argue the fact of how much relief, relief you need in your neck. You know, it's basic geometry. Um, so a little more relief than perfectly straight will be hovering a few thousandths of an inch. You don't need feeler gauges, you really don't need anything in that way. As long as there's a little bit of a gap, you're good to go. So. In this case, um, I have quite a bit more relief than I want, okay? I'm hovering around 20 thousandths. This is, uh, you guys probably have a hard time seeing this. I'm sure you do, actually. Uh, but there's a lot more relief than I'd like. So, 
before I even change the strings, I'm going to go ahead and make these adjustments so I know that the truss rod works. I don't want any surprises once I restring, you know. So, truss rod adjustment tool. Um, it's incredibly important if you do want to work on your own instruments that you have the proper truss rod adjustment tool. For a lot of imports, it's going to be metric sized Allen keys, you know. Um, for most uh, modern uh, American, or really American built instruments, um, it's, it's standard and there's either a hex or an allen key. Um, but it's really easy to find. You can find all the stuff at Home Depot or uh, your local, you know, whatever store. Um, uh, Lowe's will have, you know, a set of allen keys too and it's easy to get. If you need uh, something like a hex key for your Gibson, like a Lex Paul from the 16th, there's all sorts of websites you can get all this, uh, all of these tools, from Stuart McDonald to LMI, they're cheap, they're not expensive, and you really don't need very much to do, but having the right truss rod adjustment tool for your instrument um, is incredibly important. You, you should really have it. And periodically, you should check your own setup. You know, Sometimes the setup can get away from you. I don't know how many times I've heard um, today, uh, or yesterday rather, or since I've been attending these gatherings, where people tell me, I stopped playing this guitar for 20 years because I didn't like the way it felt. That's incredible, you know, that's incredible. And it's, and it's so sad in some ways because really, a half an hour worth of adjustments, you could have really communed with that instrument and made it your own and, and, and really had a, a wonderful time with it. You know? So, um, a, a few things here you can, you can create on if you check on your own instruments and then tune it up the pitch and keep going. You can make small adjustments on the fly as well, I think it's important. So, the, 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 the rule when you're adjusting the truss rod is pretty simple. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. If I'm tightening it, I'm making it flatter, or I'm taking the relief out of it. If I'm going to um, go ahead and uh, loosen it up, then it'll give me uh, plenty of relief. So in this case, I need to tighten it up. So I'll come back in here, I'll take the G and the G strings, and I'll kind of open it up to give myself some room. I don't know if you guys can see it. Right? In this instrument, the truss rod axis is actually right through the sound hole inside of its little hole. On other instruments, like Gibson's, um, certain period fenders, the truss rod adjustment is going to be made up the it over here. It really doesn't matter, it's the same rules that apply. So I'll go ahead, and I'll go ahead and start tightening it up in hopes that this will start tightening up, which it will. So in this case, the truss rod was completely loose. It wasn't doing anything. The string tension was really just having its way with the neck. So I put about a solid full turn on it. I'll check the neck relief again. I still have a little bit more relief than what I'd like. After I'm finished setting this guitar up, you guys should come up if you guys are interested just to see um, exactly what I'm talking about when I'm, when I'm measuring the relief in that way. But the, the, the number for all the folks that want it very specific, it's four thousandths of an inch. Four thousandths of a string um, over the seventh fret between the fourteenth and the first fret. Four thousandths, four thousandths of an inch from the string to the top of the fret. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tune it pretty close. I'm not, <clears throat> because I'm just pretty quick about it and I'm checking to see um, where the neck relief is, I'm not in playing position. When you guys are doing intonation, final tuning the instrument, you always want to do it in playing position because you will be off by a few cents. So always in playing position, never on its back when you're tuning it. Okay. Um, since I'm, this is the beginning stages of it, I have no problems with it. I just want to more or less put the, that string pull back on the neck so I can check my neck relief. So I come back again. I still have a little bit more neck relief than I'd like. We're hovering right now around 8 thousandths of an inch. Okay, I think another half turn will do it. You guys want to call me out? Yeah, feeler gauges. I welcome you to come up here. <laughs> I can see it from here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> I like this. This is almost perfectly straight. You can almost hear it. You can almost hear it. There's a hair of a gap. You're hovering around four thousand. I would say that's closer to five. This is crazy, but I'd be I'd, I'd be on point with it. I've seen so many of them. I, I know how to gauge it. You know. Um, Beautiful, I like it. I'll go ahead and tune it up. Now, the action that I measured, because I straightened the neck out that amount, I'm already thinking that my action dropped about a 64th of an inch 
um, in overall playability in terms of action go. So I'm going to come back and measure it. It was a hair over two thirty seconds, a sixteenth, and a hair over three. What do I have now? I have three sixty fourths, which is a hair under a sixteenth, and I have five sixty fourths, which is a hair under three thirty seconds. Right. So. That tells me oh, I'm looking great. This is a beautiful thing. Everything is cool. That is spec action, um, meaning two and three, or uh, a sixty-fourth under, which would be three sixty-fourths and five sixty-fourths. This would be low action for a flat top guitar. Okay, action on a flat top guitar, a little bit different than than an electric instrument because it is in fact acoustic. A great general rule uh, to think about is that the higher your action is, the better your guitar sounds. Okay? In a perfect world, everyone's action, in terms of how the instrument sounds, would be like Ranger Doug's, with action that high. You know? But few of us can, can, can hang in, in his world. You know? So you want to make it as comfortable as possible. That's why most manufacturing companies have come together to agree on that very specific spec right there. And when we receive instruments from Martin, or Taylor, or Collings, um, it's, it's right on point. Those guys have it figured out pretty well. Bill Collins at Artisan Guitars. I heard Steve make mention of it uh, just a second ago. Yeah, that'll be a that'll be a good time. If you guys get a chance, uh, you guys should definitely check him out. He's uh, he's he's brilliant. I have a lot of respect for Bill. He's super cool, and um, his instrument, Collins instruments, are are incredibly clean. They're incredibly well built. They have a great operation there. Um, the truth be told, I'd love to go down and check that guy out and see what he has to say. So if you guys have a chance, you should, you should definitely do it. Um, all right, so back to it. What this tells me is that I should be able to restring the instrument with the same gauge strings, and my action should be the same, right? The top is going to pull the same amount. The neck is going to pull the same amount, and I'm good to go. I already know that I don't have to make an adjustment to the saddle because we're spec. Okay? Okay. The nut, I'll take care of the nut as my final step in this in, in this setup process because I cannot intonate it. I'll get into that in a second. So I'll go ahead and take the strings off. Hey Greg. Yes. Quick question. Do you find when you like adjust the truss rod that the neck continues to drift a little bit and you might need to give it a little bit more time to settle in? Okay. I, I've actually heard that before. I've heard it from other repair guys. You know, and oh, you know, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and set this instrument up, but uh, I don't want you to pick it up just yet because I want to give it a couple days for it to settle in, you know, or whatever it might be. I have two people that I've never come across that. Um, I'll make an adjustment and it'll stay put. I mean, you have a reinforcement bar inside of it. Um, unless the conditions as far as humidity are, are up and down, it's really not gonna move around. You know, it'll be pretty solid. So. Maybe if, if, if uh, you know you did a neck reset and you did a bunch of work, the instrument was disassembled, then you string it up, you might need another adjustment a few hours later, but even then, no, not so much. So I'll go ahead and slack the strings. Um, you guys could use a peg liner uh, for it. I just kind of make sure it's nice and loose. Um, bridge pins, you can use the, uh, the, the peg winder itself, it has a cool little notch at the end of it. You could slip it in here and take the, uh, the bridge pins out. Greg, do you measure from the fretboard to the bottom of the string? I measure from the fret itself to the bottom of the string. And it's very important that it's the bottom of the string um, and, and, and where you look at it from. You want to make sure that you're when you're reading your ruler, that you're, you're lined up with it. You're not looking at it from the top, because you will be off by about a 64th, depending on where you look at it from. That's pretty important, too. So let's go ahead and take these strings off. The other thing I like to do is, while I have the instrument uh, disassembled, I'll go ahead and tighten up all the uh, components, make sure they're uh, nice and tight. Everything on here looks pretty cool. Um, Greg, do you find the uh, material in the bridge pen thing different sound? Great question. No. I know. I'm sorry, where did it come from? There you are. No, and that's another great... Man, I get this question a lot. That's awesome. I appreciate you bringing that what up. What's the question? Um, uh, bridge pins, if they yeah, change the way your instrument sounds. No, actually they don't. Um, or very little at, at, at best. Really what has an impact on how your instrument sounds is going to be your saddle and your nut, and that's it. 
and I get this every day, you know, and I, and I have this, I have my standard lines for this, is people tell me, hey Greg, can you make me a, a fossilized mammoth uh, saddle? You know, or can you make me an ivory saddle or whatever it might be? And I ask them why. Uh, why, why would you want that? Oh, it's because it's better. Meaning, because the material is better. Okay, but material being more expensive doesn't really translate to the instrument sounding any better. You know, or, or in that case, everyone would have like a 24 karat gold saddle. You know, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You know, so um, this instrument has plastic. You can have bone. You can have quarian. You can have fossilized mammoth. You can have ivory. You can have a bunch of different things, and they all sound a little bit different. What it's important to know is how that changes your sound. The saddle is the most important thing. Everything you play comes from the saddle. And because that saddle is the break point, your bridge pins have no effect, have zero effect, you know, on, on how the inch, or not zero, very, very little uh, impact on how it sounds. I have never found myself listening to uh, Phil Kager, just a wonderful musician, go to town and for me to turn to a friend and say, you hear those bridge pins? <laughs> Oh, I can hear it now. <laughs> You'll never do that. You know, it's just, it, just, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Out. You know? You know? Uh, a bone, uh, no, the, the reason I like to work with bone um, is because it's hard and it's not going to wear out as fast as a piece of plastic. And that's about it. As you're tuning the instrument um, over and over again, the, the string itself is actually, because it's wound, it's actually sawing it, itself further and further down. And, and, and if you have plastic, you'll get there faster than a piece of bone. So it'll last you a long time. Bone actually sounds, it sounds great too, don't get me wrong. It, it, it coupled with the right instrument, it's a beautiful thing. If you have a, uh, a Gibson, a beautiful Gibson instrument, okay? Um, Gibsons are naturally um, warm and, and almost muddy, the vintage ones. Uh, I, I had a friend of mine tell me, a great player, he told me <clears throat> that he loved uh, get old Gibson acoustics because they're so, so sad. They're sad guitars, man. That's what he always tells me, they're sad guitars, man. Well, absolutely. The reason that old uh, Gibson sound, or well, one of the reasons why they sound fantastic is because they have bone as their saddles, okay? So if I would have a wooden saddle on a Gibson guitar, it'd be so muddy, it'd be hard to, to, to listen to it, you know? That's why Gibson uh, in the 60s actually came out with an adjustable Corian saddle to brighten it up quite a bit, you know? Um, there's Martin guys and Gibson guys. For older Gibsons, the reason Gibson sounds so awesome with a piece of bone is because it really makes it brighter in a way. So you have a great balance of a naturally warm, overly warm instrument, you know? And then you have a bell-like characteristics of what would come from bone, and then it sounds fantastic. The other way to look at it is something like this. Import instruments are always notorious for being trebly. They're always trebly. They always lack the warmth of, of, um, of, of uh, you know, some of the more expensive instruments in terms of construction and, and the glues that they use. So in the case of a, of, of a lower end flat top guitar, under a thousand bucks or under whatever, 500 bucks, whatever it might be, in this case, a piece of plastic actually helps out the instrument. You don't want to make it any brighter. So in this case, a piece of plastic is actually better than a piece of bone for this very animal. So that's, that's really important because people confuse um, uh, the materials and how expensive they are, how rare they are, and the sound of your instrument. I want to bling it out and soup it up, you know, or whatever. I, tell, I, I, tell, I try to talk folks out of it all the time, you know. So, in this case, if I wanted to um, let the strings off the instrument, in this case, if I wanted to make an adjustment because I took all my measurements before I took the strings off, if I wanted to make some adjustments, I could make all my adjustments right now with the strings not in my, my, my way whatsoever. So, if I wanted to lower the action, by way of measurement, by a 64th of an inch, the general rule is you want to remove double that material from the saddle, the base of the saddle, perfectly flat, okay? So if I want to drop this by a 32nd, I'm going to start with 3 64ths, okay? That'll translate to uh, roughly half in terms of action and, and how much it felt. I always like to use a long sanding stick. I brought a small flat block, you know? If you are going to make adjustments, it's always to the bottom of the saddle, all right? You want to make sure that your block is nice and flat, all right? And you just want to go ahead and start sanding on it. 
in a perfect world, I would have a longer sanding stick, and I'd go lengthways, uh, but I'll go ahead and use the small sand as well. As I'm removing material, I'll keep looking at it just to make sure I'm flat and square. That's really, really important to be flat and square. If you're not, you'll put the saddle in, and all of a sudden, you find yourself caught. A lot of times, the actual slot itself is not perfectly snug. It should be. It should be. So one of the things I like to do is uh, make it perfectly straight, and this way I don't have to worry about it at all. In this case, I didn't have to remove any material. I was just showing you guys, but I'll go ahead and put it back. This would be the time to go ahead and make my adjustments to my action. Action is always adjusted at the saddle. The rest of uh, the instrument is a given. My, my neck relief, my nut height, that's a given. There's a very specific way to measure that. In the case of the neck, it's the 14th and the first fret. I'll get to how to measure the nut. But those are a given. Once I have that, the action gets adjusted from here to your preference. And again, 99% of, of, of all folks like it right around this neighborhood. Okay? Um, when I have the shoulders off, this would be a great time for me to clean up the board. If you guys restring your instruments, uh, I'm sorry? Great question. If I wanted to raise it, then I'd go ahead and add material to it. So I, I go uh, and I use shim stock, varying shim stock. You can get holly, maple. You can get that through Luther's Mercantile as well. And um, they come in, in, in two 30 second thickness sheets. You can go ahead and take the saddle um, and take it to the actual shim stock, the little veneer. Go ahead and glue it on there with some super glue. Okay? You take a, a razor blade cut around it, a little sandpaper just to dial it in, you put it back, all of a sudden you would have raised the action about a 64th in a 30 second shot, right? Um, so, uh, yeah. if you guys are, I'm sorry, yes? I had a guitar once where we had a shim that, we put the shim under for like the, one of them seats, spring and fall. Yep. We added the shim in the, one season because and then we had an order just to adjust it. We had the spring one, we then took it out in the other season. Sure. Just, just without having to glue it necessarily. Is, is the gluing the important part? No, I mean, you can have another saddle if you'd like, but at the same time, when you super glue a shim on there, it's really easy to slip with a razor blade if you ever want to take it off. Just go in there with a razor blade, slice it off, and you're, you're, you're back in business, you know? Most uh, high-end instruments like McPherson's, they actually supply two saddles, which is which is great, but I mean, those are super expensive, and I think that's great. I mean, they couldn't do that for, for instruments that are covering around a thousand bucks. It'd be nice, but it really doesn't make a difference, I don't think. It doesn't take that long to put a shim on there. And it, it's not going to change the sound of your instrument. Again, is it going to change it somewhat? Maybe a hair, maybe a little bit. I wouldn't be able to tell the difference, though. You know? Yeah. But as far as action, action is going to be where it needs to be. You know? But hearing that piece of, 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 of wooden veneer or shim or if you're not going to hear that. We talked about briefly upstairs with my guitar. Shim a little higher on the low new side. Right. How come everybody doesn't do that with the low Everyone should. And most people incorporate that into their specs. Well, actually, most vast majority of people do. Even on electric guitars, the treble side is always a hair lower than the bass. It's really the way it fits into your hand. You know, it's, it's naturally just a better feeling instrument. When you have action that's even across, it just has a funky feel to it. You would feel it right away. It just wouldn't feel right. Kind of thing. So, I don't know how often you guys restring your instruments. It's not important to uh, hydrate your fingerboard uh, every time you restring your instrument. It's really not. Um, but I say, Make time to do it once a year. You know whether it needs it or not. The, the board cannot absorb more than what it can pull in. You can't overhydrate your board, um, but you can under, uh, you know, hydrate in terms of drying out and cracking on you. You don't want that. So I make it um, for my own instruments. I'm a little uh, loose with my instruments because I stay so busy with everyone else's. But at the same time, I'm, it's almost a ritual. Make it. Once a year, go ahead and oil up your, your fingerboard and go ahead and clean it up with some steel wool. It's probably a good idea. It's good for it. Um, so what I do is I'll take the the, um, uh, the oil and uh, I'll go ahead and put it right on the fingerboard. If you guys have a napkin or a paper to hold it, please. So, 
I'll go ahead and, uh, and, and spread out the, uh, the oil. I'll give it a few seconds. Let it uh, let it absorb. Thanks, man. Let it absorb into uh, let it absorb into the the wood itself. It's doing a great job. The cream board is pretty thirsty. I'll leave it on there for a second. Brad, um, what, what do you use to oil it? I hear a lot of you know. Uh, um, this is actually uh, Professor Green's is actually my product. It's a, it's a good product. It works well. I like it. I'm especially proud of the uh, the oil. Um, for what it's worth, they're like strings nowadays, you know? As far as polish and oil, everyone makes a good product. They really do. Guitar Honey is great. Uh, Kaiser's Lemon Oil is great. Um, everyone makes a good product, even the polishes. Everyone's solid, same with strings. Yeah, everyone's doing a really good job. It's not like it was 20 years ago, you know, where you can actually say, I like these strings better than these, or these are not very good. Things are different. Everyone stepped up and everyone's making a solid product. But the reason I like mine is because mine is a, a little different it works just as well. Um, I, a lot of a lot of guys like it. This is really the flagship for the line, and, and I use uh, different oils. I use essential oils, it's almond oil. I use some mineral oil. I add vitamins to it, and um, it really makes for a, a great uh, lemongrass oil. Um, really makes for a nice, not too slick, um, uh, really uh, thin, able to absorb into the pores type of oil, which I think is great, and it and it stays for a long period of time. Which I like a lot. So it's all natural, right? It is all natural, yeah. What size steel wool are you using? This is four zero grade steel wool. Now, the four zero grade steel wool is different than four. The one I use is different than the four zero grade steel wool that you're able to get from your local home improvement store. I just got hit to this a few years ago because I was telling folks, oh, get four zero grade steel wool at your local Lowe's or whatever it might be, but it's actually different. You need woodworkers steel wool. It's actually a lot finer. Their four zero grade is different uh, grit than, uh, than anything you get in your home improvement store. So I would get it from uh, Luther's Mercantile as well. They sell them in huge rolls and it's pretty affordable. So I'll, take, I'll go ahead and take the uh, steel wool too, and I'll go ahead and use it to spread the oil around, but it's really important that you finish it up by cleaning up each fret going lengthwise. Even though the, the steel wool is super fine, even though the steel wool is super fine, it's still gonna leave super minor scratches, just tiny, tiny scratches in there. You won't even see it, even if I put a mirror shine on it, you won't, <clears throat> you won't really see it at all. But what's important is that it goes against the strings. You don't wanna go with the strings, because this way when you bend, you can actually hear it scratch. But if I finish going this way, you'll never hear any of it, okay? I'll come back once I, I, I cleaned up. Everything was pretty clean. I really just oiled the board. I'll come back. I agree. Uh, yeah. Is there any yeah. other question for me? He says, uh, what about the guitar? We have a kind of magnet around uh, the... pickup? Yeah, pickup, yeah. Uh, what I always do is I put a piece of masking tape over the pickup, you know? And when I'm done, I usually take a brush and just kind of brush it off and then I'll take the, the tape off and, and, and it won't hurt anything. But but the magnet will pull the steel wool fibers. Uh, on what? And my transducer is far enough away, I'm not too worried about it, you know? Yeah, on an electric guitar where the neck pickup would be super close, yeah, I'd want to go ahead and do that. You would see it pretty fast, but I'm not, uh, I try to be pretty careful about not going crazy with the steel wool, you know? There's actually, it's a great question, because a lot of repair guys, there's some repair guys that are completely against steel wool. They just won't work with it. Period. Oh, it's too messy, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's cool. Uh, then you could use uh, uh, different grit sandpapers, 2,000 micro mesh, going up to four or 5,000 grit, or whatever it might be. And that's cool, you, you can do that as well. But that's an expensive habit. Those micro mesh pads are, are pretty pricey, you know? Uh, I always like the uh, the steel wool, and I, I like a shiny thread as well. If you leave it at a thousand grit, it'll never feel right, you know, uh, or even two thousand for that matter. So I go ahead and clean it up. The fingerboard I always do terrible with time. That's how I do. I talk too much. Yeah. Yeah, question. Uh, actually, please don't. Do you ever worry about that? Because that will sign in. That oh no, I'm not worried about it. No. Okay. No. So I'll go ahead and clean it up, just wipe it down. A few things that are important, always wipe with the grain, never go cross grain. It does make a difference, you know? Um, if you see something on the instrument 
you might want to pat it off before you start rubbing <coughs> on it. Make sure you keep turning your pad, your, your polishing cloth rather. Um, once in a while, just check it out. Make sure there's nothing on it. It's pretty important. The finish on these instruments, this is poly. So this finish is bulletproof. I'm not too worried about it because even if I tried to, I couldn't scratch it. It's so hard. If this was lacquer, a nitro lacquer, nitro is super soft. If you look at it funny, you'll scratch it. You know? So you want to make sure that your, uh, your rag is nice and clean. All right? Uh, I'll clean up the top and I'll start stringing it up here. Setup. Um, in that case, you would actually have a little bit more relief in the neck because you have to stay as far away from the fret as possible. And uh, most folks um, have one instrument for slide and one instrument for just regular playing. If you want kind of middle of the line or middle of the road, so you can play both, you can't really do either wall in, in that way. But you can hang them and you can get by with a couple tunes. But um, Johnny Winter's action, I would imagine, would be for slide, right? Do you uh, oil the, um, the bridge as much as you do the fretboard? No, that no sometimes I do. Some, some bridges actually have finish on it. Some are sanded out to where they're so, uh, the pores are so tight and, and sanded out so fine that I wouldn't absorb much anyway. You know, so in this case it looked, it looked nice. I'm not worried about it. Do you cool. polish satin finished on the back? You can, depending on what polish you use. If you use this polish, it won't put a sheen on it. It won't put a shine on it, rather. It'll keep the sheen um, exactly where it is. Most uh, polishes out there are super heavy and petroleum distillates. So um, no matter what, it'll shine anything up. You know, they're nap the base or some sort of light duty solvent base, and it'll clean up your instrument really well to a point where it'll change the sheen as well. So if you have a beautiful uh, gloss top Les Paul, it'll be fantastic for it. If you have a matte or a satin finished Martin 17 or 16 or whatever it might be, um, if you use most polishes, you'll go ahead and eventually shine it up. Yeah. So, DRs come uh, two per pack. In this case, it's 6.3. Uh, the other pack would have 5.2 and then 3.1. So I'll go ahead and uh, start putting my strings in there. Do you ever use nut sauce? Or yeah. Or yeah, why not? Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, Big Ben's, I've always liked Big Ben's. They make a great product. You know, they make a great polish too. Um, and uh, that's awesome. I use um, something like uh, Big Ben's or, or some sort of nut lubricant if I'm working on an instrument with double locking trim like a like, like Floyd, you know, or scratch, not double locking trim, uh, a, a, a trim that would lock behind it, or you would have a, a Floyd that you're go, going crazy with or a tremolo that you can't moving. The nut should be actually cut string specific, okay? And the string should be allowed to move perfectly through that slot. Um, so, if the nut slot was cut perfectly, then you don't need any lubrication whatsoever. It's kind of just something extra that you do. But I do like it, you know? Speaking of that, with the tremolo, would you put lubricant on the uh, bridge? No. No. I mean, it, it, you can, I'm sure it would help. I just never found myself uh, needing it, really. I mean, I had maybe a trim that was a little creaks a little bit or whatever it might be, but in that case I wouldn't use I would use like a three in one or like a oil or something like that. Alright, string the instrument. So I'll go ahead and put all my uh, strings through the, uh, the, the, the bridge pins themselves. I take the string and I go ahead and put it through the tuner hole. Okay? I take my hand, put it over the seventh fret, lift my thumb just a hair, I grab the string from up top and I wrap it over the top of the post itself and bend the string up so it's out of your way, okay? You can use a peg winder at that point to start winding, and as soon as you get past the first one in the, in the wrap, you kind of sandwich it in between, okay? Once you get that going, you can keep cooking it. It'll actually follow uh, the post going downwards. Once I get it close, something like that, I'll come back here and put my finger on the bridge pin itself and keep tuning it. You'll hear it make some noises until it seats itself, and then you're good to go, okay? I do the same thing for all of the strings. Um, you always want to make sure that you wind the strings going into the center of the peg head. That's super important. 
again over the seventh fret and grab it. Wrap one over the top. It's going up, so it's out of the way. I'll start wrapping him. I cleared, sandwich it in there. Keep going downwards to a point. I'm right there. Hold it down. You want to have about three or so wraps on your heavier strings, maybe four. I'll start adding a few more wraps um, to the string as the strings uh, get a little bit smaller in diameter. You'll have more wraps. Come back. <laughs> Make sure it's seated. I'll come back here to G string. Same thing, about a hand over the seventh fret. I wrap it around, I wrap it the opposite way because they're all going towards the center of the peg head. I want to make sure that the ball end sits to the to the to, to the plate itself and the bridge pin holds it in place. Sometimes the ball end can get hung up around the bridge pin itself. That's why I come back and always give it a tug. Make sure that it anchors itself. Come back. Okay, question about when you first put the Bridge pin is, did you put it in carefully a certain direction? There's like a little groove. It's, it's notched, yep. Yeah. Some of the, that's a great question. Some of the older instruments actually have a solid shaft. In the case of a solid shaft, you would have a little ramp cut into the, 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 the bridge pin hole itself to allow the string to come out of it. Most modern, most, not all modern instruments are slotted in that way, so it doesn't make a difference. And it's one size, so you use the same one for the high E as you would the low E. Yeah, it would face where the string actually comes out of it. You're, you're allowing the string to actually come through that hole, so it would be facing your peg head. Right? Let's come back. Same thing. Quick work out of it. slip 
the bridge underneath it. With an arch top as well, I'll go ahead and make my measurements before I take the old strings off. So I'll find myself tuning it to pitch. I'll go ahead and adjust my, uh, my intonation on my floating bridge. And everything's cool, I'll just go ahead and take a little piece of masking tape and mark it. Right? And then I can take the strings off, everything is cool. I already know exactly where to put the bridge when I take it off, or when I put it back on rather, right? And it works. So I'll go ahead and... Uh, yeah. Um, let me get back to the forums for a second here, just for a second. There's a lot of a lot of folks that are really opinionated on all forums. That mm. goes for Gibson's vendors, whatever. Everyone, uh, unofficial Martin, whomever. Everyone is unbelievably opinionated, you know. And they're so forceful with their convictions. Everyone's got it figured out. <laughs> you know, it cracks me up. So once in a while, I kind of just read what's going on, and they. Well, sometimes, I mean, it was a lot different about five years ago, where everyone just kind of, you know, and it was completely off. Things are better now, so there's way more information out there, and folks are, are pretty close. But it, it always cracks me up when they take a position on something like that. Absolutely never take the strings off every single one of them at the same time. That's ludicrous. Who would do something like that? Then you see people chiming in with thumbs up. Yeah, I agree with this guy. You know, and so it just gets me. There's, because again, there's no real standard for any of this, so everyone gets an opinion. And almost everyone's opinion is equally as, as valid, you know. It's, it's interesting, it's a, it's a crazy world at some point. Great, love God. Hey, hey. Oh yeah, alright Steve, I got you. <laughs> so I have a tuned pitch. My relief didn't change at all, right? Didn't change at all. My action is just under 230 seconds and just under 330 seconds. So it's exactly where I left it before I took the strings off. In this case, it's ready to go minus the nut. So I'll get into this real fast. The only job that the nut has is to space the strings and get you over the first fret. That is it. That's why you can't really have a preference in your nut height. It's where it's supposed to be. You hold down the third fret and you tap over the first. As long as there's, as long as it clears the first fret, you're good to go. That's the that's the rule. Uh, third fret, tap over the first. If there's a gap there, you're good to go. If there's too much gap, you want to make it so that it's only a few thousands. But even one thousand gap will be good. Will be good enough. Once it's resting on the first fret, you can rest assured that when you play it open, it's going to buzz. In this case, it lined up, the nut slots are cut right, I would have made all my adjustments to the saddle, the neck is exactly where I need it to be, the action is where it needs to be, the setup is done in this case. This is really it, this is this is a, a setup on a flat top guitar, it's pretty straightforward. You know, there's, there's really not much to it. In this order, adjust the neck step one, adjust the saddle at the bridge in step two, adjust your nut slot step three, and intonation is four. If you follow this recipe, it applies to every single setup out there, and you'll have a wonderful setup instrument. Any other questions? Yes? How do you adjust the nut? that takes them away? There's some way? You use nut files. Nut files for it. I actually did a video for, I think it's on Gibson's website, on, on adding material. I use a, a piece of cotton. I use a, a Q-tip. I take some of the cotton off of it, and I make a little, I roll it, so I, I, I create a little, uh, material that I'm able to place into the, the slot itself, and I let it hang over the nut in either direction, and I wait a little bit of super glue on one side, and it just suck itself in, and uh, Q-tip, that cotton, has a natural accelerator in it, so it'll harden up in, in, in five seconds. And you can just go ahead and cut it off, cut it off the contour of the nut, and I can keep, keep filing away. Yeah. Yes, sir? Wouldn't you going to be a master I'll be in Nazareth in August, August 22nd. I have a workshop with the uh, Nazareth uh, Guitar Institute in August. And I'm putting together another workshop uh, here in National in April. So if you guys are interested, just give me an email. It'll be a weekend workshop. We'll do uh, prep work and, and setup work. It's a great time. It's a Saturday and a Sunday. And um, just ask Barbara. She took a class. She loved it. And, uh, and, and if you guys are interested, yeah, just give me a, uh, drop me a line or give me a call. Whatever, whatever. Any questions? Thank you, Greg. Thank you.